If you would just remain standing just for a few more minutes. I want to say that it is a privilege to be able to speak here this year in this conference. I was just thinking as I was standing there that this is my 30th conference. I've missed two in my whole life. So if you can do your maths, you can figure out that I'm getting old. (laughs) But I still enjoy General Conference. I still love the move of God that we have here at General Conference. I still love being together with our brothers and sisters from around Australia. There's just something about getting together. And there's just something about praising the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, I, someone said to me once, they said, you know, you Pentecostals, he said, why don't you just be quiet and let the preacher preach? And, and I, I said, well, that's, that's a good point, I guess. You know, I, you could be put off by some people saying amen and that. But let me just tell you something. You don't have to say amen or praise the Lord or hoop de la, whatever you want. It's not going to make me preach any better. But what it is going to do, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2 says this. It says, for, the, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Everyone say two groups of people. But the word preached did not profit them. One group, it didn't profit them. Because it was not mixed with faith. In them that heard it. So I could preach my lungs out tonight and preach my my shoes off and socks down or whatever you like. But unless you're going to mix your faith with it, it's not going to profit you. So if I say something tonight and you think, well, that's good. I'm going to claim that. I want to hear you say amen. I want you to claim that and say, I claim that in Jesus' name. I mix my faith with that. I'm going to have that. I need that in my life. I need that in my church. We've got to mix our faith with the word. It's not just about supporting the preacher, but it's about mixing our faith with the word. Amen. As I said, it's a privilege to be here at this conference and to be able to preach. I thank the executive board for this opportunity. But if the truth be known, I would come here to mow the lawns if they asked me to. I count it a great privilege. If we could turn in our Bibles as we remain standing to the book of 1 Kings chapter 18. And we're going to start reading in verse 37. 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 37. We're going to read through to verse 45. Before we leave here tonight, we need to have a supernatural apostolic explosion. I'm praying for a supernatural apostolic explosion that literally shakes this place. We need an apostolic supernatural downpour that floods this place. We need to leave this place totally drenched in the Holy Ghost. I'm believing for some old time power. I'm believing for some old time church. You know, you might say, well, what, what right have you got to, to expect that? I say, we're a book of Acts church. We are too great a people to limit ourselves to ordinary church. Anybody believe me there? We are too great a people to limit ourselves to ordinary church. I tell you, if Satan can stir this city, if Satan can stir this country, if Satan can have a revival, this Holy Ghost filled, Jesus name church can have more than the devil ever wanted or ever asked for. First Kings chapter 18 says, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God. And that thou hast turned their heart back again. Verse 38 says, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Elijah is having a showdown with 850 false prophets. Verse 39 says, it says, And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Ahab, get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of an abundance of rain. 
So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went to the top of Mount Carmel. And he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, he said, go up now and look towards the sea. And he went up and he looked. And the servant said, there is nothing. And he said, go again. He said, go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, behold, there ariseth a little cloud. There arises a little cloud out of the sea, like a man's hand. And he said, go up, say unto Ahab, prepare thy chariot and get thee down that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with the cloud and wind and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went with Jezreel. And you also read that Elijah ran before the wicked king of Ahab. My second text in Psalms chapter 85 and verse 6. It says simply this. And if we could have it on the screen it says. Psalm 85 and verse 6. Wilt thou not revive us again? That thy people may rejoice in thee. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we love you tonight. Let faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Lord, I pray that we would mix our faith with the word tonight and you would do a mighty work in this place. Lord, my prayer is that you would revive us again. Renew our passion, Lord. Renew our faith. Renew our desire for revival. Give us a fresh vision, Lord. Let your word inspire us. Push us to greater heights. Renew us. Revive us. Refresh us. Refill us, Lord. Come on, let's say that. Renew us, Lord. Revive us, Lord. Refresh us, Lord. Refill us, Lord. In Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. You may be seated. An article published by the Bureau of Meteorology states that Australia is the driest inhabited continent in the world. We experience a lot of drought in Australia. A drought is simply this. It's a prolonged, abnormal, dry period where there is not enough water for a user's normal needs. And there's something that comes with drought that I'm sure you're all well aware of And many of those in this building have experienced it in the last few years. How many people have water restrictions in their town or city? Water restrictions. Water restrictions are currently in place in many regions across Australia. The state governments will will say and the councils will say, you're not allowed to water your lawn. You're not allowed to use a sprinkler. You're not allowed to wash your vehicle. You're not allowed to hose down paved areas. You're not allowed to refill your swimming pool. The shortage of water results in these water restrictions. And it had led the government to begin to look for alternative water sources. Everyone say alternative water sources. To supplement existing water sources. We are learning how to stop the drop. We're learning about recycling water, and and let me just add to that, that isn't water always recycled? Doesn't it just condense back up and come back down again? We're learning now the special consideration, whether it should be a half flush or a full flush. We're learning how to be water wise. We're learning about alternative means of gardening. Many here have probably ripped up their old English lawn and have replaced it with some gravel and some tussock or something like that. Water restrictions have caused people to give up on growing a lawn. Instead, the new thing is to plant what they call drought-tolerant gardens. In the last year or so, a year and a half, I've learned, and I'm sure you've learned also, that it is now possible for dirt to fall from the sky with the rain. We've had those bad dust storms and I come out in the morning and my car's covered in red dust. I hate drought. I hate water restrictions. And I'm sure all of you here have have felt the impact of drought sometime in your life. 
Eventually, it doesn't matter where you live, we will all experience the impact of drought, higher food prices, and the economy. It affects the economy. But the Bureau of Meteorology said something that I didn't agree with. The Bureau says Australians must learn to live with drought. But I am here tonight to proclaim in the spirit that I refuse to learn to live with drought. They say we have to learn to live with drought, but I'm here to proclaim in the spiritual. I refuse to live in drought. I refuse to live in drought. I'm praying for rain because I can hear the sound of an abundance of rain. I can hear revival. One of the more interesting advances of recent times is the idea of seeding the clouds. Has anyone ever heard of that? Cloud seeding. Cloud seeding is a form of weather modification, they call it. It's an attempt to change the amount of rain that falls by dispersing substances into the air that causes condensation and causes the rain to come. Pardon me tonight, but I'm here under divine instruction to seed the clouds. I'm here to seed the clouds. Tonight we are here to to disperse a substance into the atmosphere. I'm here to disperse a substance into the atmosphere that's going to bring rain. Tonight I want to build your faith and that we would disperse our faith into the heavenlies. That we would see the clouds with our faith and that we would see the rains of revival in Australia. I refuse to live in drought. I refuse to give up on the rain. I want the rain. We need revival. I can see a little cloud. It's like a man's hand, but an abundance of rain is on the way. I can hear the sound of an abundance of rain. I can see the sky is black with clouds. I can hear the wind. And all I can say is, Lord, send the rain. I want to title my message tonight this, Brother Nathan. We need the rain. We need the rain. In our text, 1 Kings 18, Israel and the rest of the Middle East, they depended on seasonal rainfall. When Israel had disobeyed God, God shut up the heaven and there was no rain. Everything began to die. The Bible says that there was no rain for three and a half years. And under the king, under King Ahab and his wife Jezebel, Israel had backslidden. They had fallen prey to idolatry and unrighteousness, which ultimately brought the judgment of God upon their land. And at the word of the Lord, there was no rain and no dew for three and a half years. God had called back his blessing and declared drought and famine in the land. The land was depressed. The economy was depressed. And the people of God were depressed. They needed a breakthrough. They needed the rain. And the word of Lord of the Lord came to Elijah and said, Go and show yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the earth. I want you to notice this. God spoke and Elijah heard and listened and obeyed. I mean, I could preach a little while on that tonight. You know, sometimes we can block the will of God with our disobedience. Elijah heard the word, he listened and he obeyed. But Elijah asks a very profound question in 1 Kings 18, 21. And he says, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, then follow Him. But if Baal, then follow Him. And the people answered Him, Not a word. You see, the problem was, is that they were trying to serve two masters. Everyone say two masters. And let me give you a recipe for a spiritual drought in your life. If you continue, it will end in your spiritual death. When you think you can live for God and still do the same things that the world does. 
Let me give you a recipe for spiritual drought when you think you can live for God and you can live for the world. Let me give you a recipe for spiritual doubt when you compromise. You can't expect anything else but a drought. Compromise is the recipe for spiritual suicide in your life. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 17 says, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. 1 John 2.15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Other scriptures say you cannot serve God and mammon. No man can serve two masters. I'm telling you tonight that the recipe for a spiritual drought is compromise. You can't serve God and this world at the same time. And let me take a little bit of time to speak to the young people. If you want to save yourself from a lot of distress, don't live in compromise. Live for Jesus. I know it's hard. I know it's hard to live for Jesus, but let me tell you, you save yourself a lot of headaches if you just live for Jesus. You'll save yourself a lot of scars if you just live for Jesus. Hallelujah. So Israel, they were halted between two opinions. If you're feeling spiritually dry here tonight, it's time to make up your mind. How long shall you halt between two opinions? How long will you halt between two ways of thinking? I'm here to tell you it is lukewarmness that makes God sick. It makes Him sick. It was time for a shift in their belief system. And Israel, they had to to decide what they were going to do. You cannot serve both. Choose you this day whom you will serve. So Elijah says, how long will you halt between two opinions? Now take this into account. Elijah is one man. Everyone say one man. And there's 850 false prophets. 850 false prophets. You think you've got it hard in your city. I don't know what I would have done. I probably would have run. 850 false prophets. And before the duel started, before the showdown started, Elijah, remember he's only one. He sets out the ground rules. He doesn't let the 850 set the ground rules for the showdown. He says, I'm not going to be playing by your rules, guys. We don't, you know, we can get so intimidated, hey. Elijah was in a situation where he probably could have justified being intimidated. It's one versus 850 false prophets. I'm here to tell the church tonight, we don't need to be intimidated by the large crowds in the churches around the corner. We don't need them to show us how to worship. We don't need them to show us how to have church. We don't need to get get them to show us how to have a move of God. We don't need to compromise to have a crowd. You got me there? It's one versus 850. And Elijah sets out the ground rules. I don't care how big the church is around the corner. I'm not going to compromise. I've got the truth. I'm going to stand on His Word. Don't you be intimidated by the crowd around the corner. Don't you be intimidated. Elijah said, he said, we're going to have a challenge. Elijah said, we're going to see who the real God is. We're going to see who the real God is. And Elijah set the rules and he said, let the God that answers by fire, let him be God. You know why he said that? You know why he said that? He knew they didn't have a chance. He knew. He knew his God was a consuming fire. He knew who his God was. He knew who God was. And I'm glad that we know who God is today. I'm glad that we have the truth of the oneness of God. Jesus is God. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. 
<laughs> you can't go in a battle against 850 false prophets unless you know who God is. I'm glad we know who God is. I refuse to be intimidated. There is but one God and Jesus is His name. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm glad we know the oneness of God, the mighty God in Christ, that Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. God didn't send His Son, but He robed Himself in flesh and came and died for us on the cross. Hallelujah. Listen to this. They had crowds, but Elijah had truth. Young people, they had crowds, but Elijah had truth. They had crowds, but Elijah had truth. And I'm here to tell you, one man, one man with truth is greater than a crowd in error. One man in truth is greater than the crowd in error. One man with truth is greater than a crowd in error. Don't you be intimidated. <laughs> Elijah said three times, everyone say three times. They're building these altars for the fire to fall, you know, to see who, whose God is going to consume the sacrifice. And Elijah said three times, he said, don't put any fire under it. Don't put any fire under the altar. That's God's part. Our part will be to kill the bullock. Our part will be to gather the stones and the wood and, and to lay the sacrifice out. Our part is to pray. God's part is to provide the fire. God says, you've done all you can do. Now it's my time to step in and provide the fire. Elijah makes it even more challenging. He takes a couple of big barrels of water and he throws it over his sacrifice. i am tell you why he did that. Because his God can work in a disadvantaged situation. If you're in a disadvantaged situation, pastor, if you think you don't have what it takes to build a church, I'm here to tell you God will consume the sacrifice in a disadvantaged situation. You may be seated. I tell you what I feel in my spirit. Let me go out there tonight. There are a lot of people here tonight, and I felt it, not just tonight, but around our movement. Executive board members, pastors, youth leaders, women's ministry leaders, men's ministry leaders, evangelists, youth leaders. I believe that we can easily fall into a state of intimidation. I want to talk about a man that I, I went and preached for this year, Brother Takina. I went to Bundaberg, it was my first time. Picked me up from the airport, took me to his church, and as he's driving there, all he can talk about is the work of God. What God is doing in the city. He hadn't been there very long. He told me, he said, we had our first meeting. We, were, we invited the mayor to the, to the church. He said things like, we may as well get him to know the church now because he's certainly going to know about it later. We turned up to church. Church is, you know, pretty much full. Brother Takina, he hasn't been there very long. And he, he pulls me aside after church. He goes, see, uh, Brother Downs, we're going to be extending our church out here. We can fit another 50 people here. And we're going to extend over here. We can fit another 80 people. What I picked up there, I did not sense one little bit of intimidation. He could have gone and said, I'm in Bundaberg. There's a whole lot of other churches here. We're the tongue talkers. And, you know, they don't like us. I'm intimidated. Let's just be quiet until we get a few people, hey? He didn't say that. He was not intimidated. And that inspired me. Once upon a time, you burnt with fervency. You pursued your God-given dreams. Once upon a time, you dreamt of doing great things for God. 
Once upon a time, pastors, you dreamt that your church would be full. You, you would be having multiple services, daughter works throughout the city, a church building, hundreds of people being filled with the Holy Ghost each year, hundreds of people being baptised in Jesus' name. And I'm sorry to say that I'm here to preach to those that have given up on their God-given dreams and visions. Because now you sit back and you say, I was foolish. That was just youthful enthusiasm. It's too hard. You know, we filled our building. It's enough. We need more. You know, we just need to just maintain the status quo. It's hard work. This is an uphill battle. Let me tell you, we need some more young men seeing visions. And we need some old men dreaming dreams. I'm here to inspire you to lift your faith to another level. You know, we can get so intimidated. We've worked so hard. We've accumulated all you've got and you put yourself into it and you find yourself falling short. Even after you've put everything in, your energy, your talent, your finances, you find that you are falling short of accomplishing that dream that God gave you. That vision that God gave you. You, this results in fear. It results in frustration. It, it results in intimidation, inferiority complexes. And you become satisfied just to maintain the status quo. I'm talking to church leaders here tonight. You're serving God. You're doing your best. But you've given up on those God-given dreams, that vision. I believe tonight that the adversity of your soul would like to bring you into a position of hopelessness where you are overwhelmed, where you've resolved that the whole thing is simply beyond you, where the whole thing is just too high, too much, too far. You say it's beyond me. It's beyond our church. It's beyond the United Pentecostal Church of Australia. And some of you have fallen into a state where you're too scared to even talk about that vision any longer. For fear that people might think you're crazy. I'm glad Brother Takina didn't do that. Hundreds, thousands. I didn't want to even put a number on it because his number would be higher. But I believe I'm preaching to people today who have high and lofty spiritual aspirations. I believe I'm preaching to people today who want to do something great for God. You must not be overcome with fears of hopelessness, insecurity, inferiority complexes. Yes, you cannot do it. I'm here to tell you it's not weakness. It's not your intellect. It's not because of the city that you pastor in. It's not because of your personality. It's not because of a lack of money. But that is that feeling is there by divine design. God says, I will let you go so far. And after you've done all that you can, you still won't be able to reach it. Because where you are and where you want to go you cannot go there without God. <laughs> There's no reason to feel hopeless. There's no reason to feel inferior. There's no reason to feel intimidated. There's no reason to give up. There's no reason to be there's no reason to give up being used by God. There's no reason to give up seeing a great move of God. But God wants you to know that that feeling is not there by accident, but he designed it that way. Because that is God's part. You cannot reach it. You cannot touch it. The only way you will get there is if God puts you there. When you've done all you can do, God will do what He can. Don't silence your voice. Don't settle for less than God's great plan for your life. We reach for spiritual things of God. Don't give up. I'm pressing forward. Renew my vision, Lord. Renew my passion. Refill me with enthusiasm for the work of God. I refuse to be intimidated. I refuse to feel inferior. I refuse to feel hopeless. I refuse to feel inadequate. I'm not giving up. I'm just trusting God because I can hear the sound of an abundance of rain. 
I'm here to tell you God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we could ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. God says you've done all you can. Now it's time for me to step in and provide the fire. Look at this, listen. For a while it was hard to tell the true from the false. It was hard to tell the true from the false. The true was killing a bullock. And the false was killing a bullock. The true were building an altar. And the false were building an altar. The true were praying. And the false were praying. United Pentecostal Church of Australia. The only thing that makes us different is the part that we cannot do. The power of God that moves in our church. It's the fire that falls that nobody else can duplicate. That is God's part. And I'm here to tell you that separation brings the anointing. I refuse to compromise. I know who God is and He is going to answer by fire. You know, sometimes we look at it, we feel, we look at the church down the road and they're they're doing the same things. But let me tell you, the difference is the bit that God provides, the bit that we cannot do. And I, I, I like what I feel in United Pentecostal Church. There is an anointing that comes because of our separation. You cannot just go to any church and feel the presence of God that you feel in this place tonight and in your church back at home. I've had many people and I've talked to many people that have left and gone to another church. I'm not here to run down other churches, but they will say something like this. There's just something missing. The music might be better over there. They might have some fancy lights. They might speak nice sermons. They might wear really nice suits. They might have lots of money. But I don't want to be anywhere where God isn't moving. I don't want to be anywhere where the anointing isn't. I don't want to be anywhere where the fire doesn't fall. Separation brings the anointing. I don't want to lose it. Young preachers, I don't want to lose it. And you don't want to lose it. I'm ordinary enough in preaching, let alone if God doesn't anoint me. You think you're so good you can preach without the anointing? I'd love to see it. You'd just be like a tinkling bell or a sounding cymbal. I need the anointing. You need the anointing. Young preachers, preach with the anointing. Live a separated life. Young people, live separated unto God and God will anoint your ministry. So God answered by fire. Elijah, the sacrifice was consumed. But I want you to notice if we would look at verse 38 of 1 Kings, verse 18, it says, Then the fire fell, the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Now, I want you to listen to me very carefully now. Revelation came. The fire fell from heaven and the people got revelation. They said, the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. They got revelation. All the people saw it and they had revelation. They said, the Lord, He is God. I'm thankful for our great services. I'm thankful for the powerful anointed worship that we have in church. I'm thankful for good preaching, anointed preaching. Thank God for the fire that falls in our services. Thank God for revelation that comes through the preaching of God's Word. Pentecostals know how to do it just right. I'm here to say the United Pentecostal Church has got it right when it comes to the plan of salvation and the oneness of God. 
the, the United Pentecostal Church has got it right when we say we must not be of the world. We must be separated. We've got it right. I thank God for revelation that we have. I thank God for the revelation of the mighty God in Christ, the oneness of God. There is one God, Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I thank God for the revelation of baptism in Jesus' name and the importance of Jesus' name. I thank God for the revelation of the necessity of being filled with the Spirit, evidenced by speaking in other tongues. Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I thank God for Acts 2, 38. I thank God for revelation of the importance of living a life of separation from the world. Be not conformed to this world. Be in the world, but not of the world. These are non-negotiables. Everyone say non-negotiables. I thank God for the United Pentecostal Church that we are Bible-based. Come on. Come on. I thank God that we are conservative in, the, in, our, in our behavior in this world. I thank God for the revelation that we have. But all the revelation in the world won't mean very much if you are dying from a lack of rain. All the revelation in the world will not mean anything if you are dying from a lack of rain. You can have the truth in your church, but if it's not raining, if you're in, in drought, it is of no use. We need the truth. I thank God for revelation, but I'm not just staying there anymore because I can hear the sound of an abundance of rain. New life is coming. Revival is coming. Refilling is coming. Rejuvenation is coming. We've got to come to the conclusion that our revelation alone is not enough in our churches. We need a Holy Ghost outpouring of rain. 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 Rain. Revelation was not enough. The fire fell from heaven and consumed the sacrifice. It was not, but the fire was not the, what, the result that they were looking for. The land was in drought for three and a half years. The fire was not the promise from God. It was part of the breakthrough, but there was more to come. There was no rain, there was no dew for three and a half years. The land was depressed, the economy was depressed, the people of God were depressed. They needed a breakthrough, they needed God to send the rain. I tell you, rain is important. We need the rain. If we don't have rain, we have famine. Everyone say famine. And the line between famine and plenty in the Bible was just very thin. You could easily fall into famine without rain. We need rain or people go hungry. We need rain or there will be death. We need rain or the wealth or prosperity of Israel would have been affected. We need rain for the inheritance that we are going to leave for our children. If we don't have rain, what are we going to have to pass on to the next generation? We will pass them the truth. But if there's been a drought, there's been nothing flourishing. There's no seed in the, in the big reservoirs. There's no water. What's going to happen to future generations? The beasts, the livestock, the working animals would suffer. They would die. 
The wealth and prosperity of Israel would be affected. Without rain, there would be no inheritance to leave the children. They needed the rain for the future generations. And we are a Pentecostal church. We are not a denomination as such, but we are a people that have had the Pentecostal experience. This church was built on experience. Pentecostal, it's not a denomination. It's an experience that goes back 2,000 years to the upper room. It's not some man-made religion, but this is an experience. And if we don't have the reign of the Holy Spirit, what are we? What can we do? We are, if we are in drought, all the revelation in the world is going to be of no use because we are dying. Right after the fire fell from heaven, revelation came. They said, the Lord, He is God. But if you look at your Bible, Elijah wasn't satisfied just with the fire falling. He turned and he went for the rain. He turned and he went for the rain. The fire was the guarantee it was the down payment that the rain was coming. Restoration, salvation, deliverance, healing, life, health, strength, food, prosperity. Plenty was coming. Rain meant no limits, no boundaries. Increase all around. Another level, another harvest. An inheritance would be left for the children. It was a sign of the promise which was soon to come. I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. I praise God that we know have, we have revelation, but I'm now looking for the rain. I'm now looking for the, the rain. Elijah proclaimed, he said, I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. I don't see it yet, but I know it's close. I can hear it. Can you hear it tonight? Can you hear it tonight? Can you hear it tonight? Mix your faith with the word tonight. Mix your faith with the word tonight. Pastors, claim that in Jesus' name. I can hear the sound of an abundance of rain. I can hear the sound of an abundance of rain. I can hear the sound of an abundance of rain. Elijah wasn't satisfied with the fire. No, because the rain was coming. Breakthrough. Everyone say breakthrough. Breakthrough was at the door. Health was at hand. Growth and the will of God was yet to come. Elijah went to the top of Mount Carmel and he prayed. We need a breakthrough. We need a breakthrough. We need a spiritual downpour in this place. We've got the truth. But a whole lot of us, including myself, could do with a good refilling of the Holy Ghost tonight. Lord, send the rain. You know, I grew up in Pentecost. And I remember hearing the stories of the old tent revivals that went all night. I grew up in Pentecost hearing the stories of people getting filled with the Holy Ghost and speaking with tongues to four o'clock in the morning. I grew up in Pentecost, Brother Slack, when they used to march the streets with trumpets down the main street of Belmore. Where God just exploded in the house. People just laid out in the spirit. Speaking in other tongues. That's real Pentecost. But I'm afraid we've probably come a little bit too technological. A little bit too stiff and starchy. We're afraid what they might think about us. But I'm not intimidated to be a Pentecostal. I'm looking for the rain. We need the rain. God send the rain. Let me tell you tonight, if you need the Holy Ghost in this place, you can be filled with the Holy Ghost. Open up your mouth and begin to praise the Lord. Wherever you are, whoever you are, God will fill you with the Holy Ghost. You can have the Pentecostal experience tonight. Pentecost is still alive. It's still real. It's still alive. It's still relevant. Young people, 
Why does it take a 60 year old man to run around the church? Come on, young people, get up and praise the Lord. We're about Pentecost. Let's have revival in this place. Look at these men, they're old time. Hallelujah, Lord send the rain, Lord send the rain, hallelujah, Lord send the rain. We need a downpour in Melbourne, we need a downpour in Canberra, we need a downpour in Perth, we need a downpour in Sydney, we need a downpour in Adelaide. We need a downpour in Brisbane. We need a downpour in Townsville. We need a downpour in the Torres Strait. We need a downpour in Shell Harbour. We need a downpour in Wollongong, Central Australia, Rockhampton, Mackay, Charters Towers, Bundaberg, Yulamu, Yudnamu, Nirupi, Alice Springs. Lord, send the rain. Come on, speak in tongues. Come on, get refilled with the Holy Ghost tonight. Get a fresh touch. Get a fresh anointing. Come on, reach out. Get filled with the Holy Ghost all over again. Leave this place full of the Holy Ghost. Lord, send the rain. Hallelujah. There are those among us who still look to the sky and they say there is nothing. But I say, go again, go again, go again. Go until your something becomes something. Go until your nothing becomes something. Go until you can see the black clouds. Go again until you can see the rain coming. I refuse to take no for a final answer. Lord, let the clouds burst in this place tonight. Lord, let the clouds burst. Let there be a revival in the desert. Fill us again with the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You need the Holy Ghost. Start praying now. Start praising. Pray you turn to the person next to you if they need the Holy Ghost. You lay hands on them. We're going to have all time Pentecost tonight. We need the rain. Rain on us, Lord. Rain on us. You don't need polished music. You don't need polished preaching. You don't need lights and special effects. What you need is the rain of the Holy Ghost. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Immediately after the victory, immediately after the false prophets were killed, Elijah stopped and he declared that he heard a sound of an abundance of rain. Picture this, right after the spiritual warfare, right after Elijah was victorious, Elijah turned himself towards the sea and he began to look for rain. I'm here to encourage someone tonight. After the battle and after the victory comes the rain. Whatever you're going through, after the battle and after the victory comes the rain. If you're battling here tonight, let me tell you, the rain is coming. Pastor, if you're battling, I'm here to tell you, the rain is coming. The rain is coming. Young people, the rain is coming. Let the Spirit fall in this place. Hallelujah! It may be small, but the abundance of rain is coming. It's coming. It's coming. Joel chapter 2 and verse 23. And we're going to have a move of God tonight. Are you believing me? If you need the Holy Ghost, don't you stop praying. You keep seeking God. I want everybody to leave this place full of the Holy Ghost. I said full of the Holy Ghost. 
Joel said, he said it like this. Joel said it like this. He said, be glad. Be glad, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former and the latter rain in the first month. The threshing floors will be full of wheat and the vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the crawling locusts, the consuming locusts, the chewing locusts, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord. I tell you, I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. No limits, no boundaries, increase all around me. Come on, pray in the Holy Ghost. Lift up your voice and pray. Hallelujah. If you need the Holy Ghost, I want you to come and stand out the front right here, right along the front. If you've never been filled with the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues, I want you to come and stand right here along the front. I don't want you to kneel. I don't want you to bawl your eyes out. Just come and stand here expecting to be filled with the Holy Ghost. You need the Holy Ghost, you come. We're going to pray for you to receive the Holy Ghost. The children are coming. Yes, there will be another generation. There will be another generation of Pentecostals. There will be another generation of those that believe in the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I call some preachers, some men of faith to come now. And let's pray. We're going to see an outpouring of the Holy Ghost in this place tonight. Come on, young children. You stand up, lift your hands and praise God. Come on, lift your hands and praise Him. You need the Holy Ghost. God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Yes, sister. Hallelujah. We need some people with faith to come and pray for these children. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, receive you the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Oh, Hallelujah. Lord, send the rain. Lord, send the rain. Come on, don't you be shy. You come. Let's lift our hands. Come on, stretch your hands towards the front for these young people, for these adults. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I hear the sound of abundance of rain. The ground is dry. The air is dry, but I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. Revival is coming. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, lift up your voice, young people.